Coming up on this Wednesday edition of Daybreak, the government puts forth the revised version of its tax hike plan, excluding the lower income bracket. The ruling party supports the revision, but the opposition says conglomerates and the super rich still need to pay more. A group of opposition lawmakers plan to visit Japan's controversial Yasukuni Shrine tomorrow to express regret towards the Abe administration's rightist political agenda. Tensions are expected to run high as August 15th is the anniversary of Japan's surrender in World War II. Plus, as negotiators from Israel and Palestine are set to start their second round of peace talks in Jerusalem on Wednesday, Israel releases the first group of long-term Palestinian prisoners it promised as part of the peace deal. Daybreak begins now. You're watching Daybreak on Wednesday, August 14th, and I'm Choi Yusun here in Seoul. We begin with Korea's big debate over taxes and who should pay more. The latest proposed revision to the tax code leaves those making less than 50,000 U.S. dollars a year safe from paying more taxes. The ruling party has given the revision its full support, but the main opposition party continues to insist conglomerates and the wealthy should shoulder more of the burden. Our Kim hyun has more. The ruling Senuri party rounded up its lawmakers on Tuesday to discuss how the Park Geun-hye administration should rewrite the tax code. Finance Minister Hyun Oh-seok also attended the meeting. The government released a tax code revision plan last week only to scrap it and start the process over again from scratch this week. The government's initial proposal drew heavy criticism from the opposition party and workers, who said the plan favored the rich and large businesses. At the meeting of lawmakers, the ruling party's floor leader, Choi kyung hwan apologized on behalf of his party for failing to live up to people's expectations. We requested that the government rewrite the tax code in order to reduce the burden on low-income households, while keeping it unchanged for the middle class through income tax deductions. We also asked the government to toughen taxation on high-income professionals and the self-employed, whose incomes have not been transparently exposed. The tax code proposal that was made last Thursday would have increased taxes on some 4.3 million salaried workers with an annual income of more than 31,000 U.S. dollars. But the government and the ruling party are now looking into increasing taxes on workers earning more than $49,000 a year. If the baseline gets adjusted as such, some 2.1 million workers will foot a bigger tax bill. That's about 2.2 million people less than the government's initial tax plan would have affected. The adjustment would also mean tax revenues falling by about $390 million. To make up for such a revenue shortfall, the government is now looking into ways to prevent tax evasions committed by high-income earners while avoiding additional taxes on large firms or individuals in a higher tax bracket. But the opposition party wants the government to retract tax cuts on the rich altogether. Kim hyun Arirang News. Two local courts have both issued a search and seizure warrant of the National Archives as part of efforts to find the missing 2007 inter-Korean summit transcript. State prosecutors sought warrants from the Seoul High Court as well as the Seoul Central District Court to look for classified records from the former No Mu Hyun administration. They are kept at the Presidential Archives, access to which requires special approval. The court said, however, that prosecutors can only take a look at the copied version of the documents as there are concerns about damaging the original records. The transcript became a hot political issue following the ruling party's claims. Former President No had offered to give up a de facto inter-Korean maritime border to then-North Korean leader Kim Jong-il. 
For the first time since President Park Geun-hye took office in February, South Korean civic groups have been given the green light to enter North Korea to oversee the distribution of aid supplies. The approval comes as the two Koreas are set to hold their seventh round of talks later today on normalizing operations at the joint Kaesang Industrial Complex. Our Hwang Sung-hee has more. Two South Korean civic groups will visit North Korea on Saturday to monitor the distribution of their aid supplies. The trip, approved by Seoul's Unification Ministry on Tuesday, will be the first approved visit of a civilian group to the north since President Park Geun-hye took office in February. A total of 18 South Koreans will fly into Pyongyang from China on Wednesday and begin their inspection with North Korean officials over a four-day period. The two aid groups will oversee the distribution of around $330,000 worth of medicine and other supplies to North Korean children. Meanwhile, the two Koreas will meet for their seventh round of talks on Wednesday in Kaesong as they try to reopen their jointly run factory zone in the north. Operations at the Kaesong Industrial Complex came to a halt after North Korea withdrew all of its workers in April amid an escalation in inter Korean tensions. The shutdown has resulted in nearly a billion dollars in losses for South Korean businesses with operations in Kaesong. Seoul wants a guarantee that Pyongyang will never push ahead with such unilateral closures again before reopening the complex, while North Korea has been pushing for an immediate resumption of operations. Experts are expecting the two Koreas to make some progress in Wednesday's talks, as it is their first meeting in weeks. If they fail to reach an agreement this time around, some say the upcoming joint military drill between Seoul and Washington next week may break any momentum gained in dialogue. Hwang sang Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye attended the launch ceremony of a Korean-built submarine Tuesday in the country's southern city of Koje. She used the occasion to send a strong message to North Korea and Japan. Our presidential correspondent Oh Jin-ju has the details. President Park made it clear that South Korea will never tolerate any attempt by foreign forces to hurt its national interest and sovereignty over its territorial waters. Speaking at the launch ceremony of the fourth South Korean-built submarine on Tuesday, President Park emphasized the importance of strong defense capability. She also expressed her respect to the young soldiers who had sacrificed their lives to protect the northern limit line, the de facto maritime border between the two Koreas, saying they made it possible for the country to secure peace on the West Sea. Political pundits say President Park's remarks demonstrate her firm determination to protect the NLL from North Korea and the easternmost Tokdo Islands from Japan. In particular, with the country's Liberation Day coming up this week, experts speculate that the president was sending an indirect warning to Japan that Seoul will not let them get away with any provocations over Tokdo. It's worth noting that the submarine launched on Tuesday is named after South Korea's independence activist Kim Jua Jin, who led a winning battle against the Japanese army in 1920. Furthermore, experts say President Park's comments about the NLL fall in line with her call to the ruling and opposition parties last month to make their determination to protect the NLL clear to the public instead of continuing their fight over the issue. The NLL has become an increasingly controversial matter in the political arena after the ruling Senate party claimed former President Noh Mo Hyun suggested giving up the NLL during the 2007 inter-Korean summit. Oh Jin Ju, News. Four lawmakers from Korea's main opposition Democratic Party will visit Japan's controversial Yasukuni Shrine on Thursday, Korea's Liberation Day. The lawmakers are scheduled to hold a press conference at the shrine to denounce Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's move to the right, which endorses nationalistic moves like reviving Japan's militaristic past. They will also urge Tokyo to take steps to promote peace in Northeast Asia and to release all information related to the radiation leakage at Japan's Fukushima nuclear power plant. Local police have warned the lawmakers, saying they could agitate Japanese activists at the site. 
The Yasukuni Shrine honors Japan's war dead, including more than a dozen Class A war criminals. Twelve Korean women used as sex slaves for the Japanese military during World War II applied for mediation in a local court on Tuesday before lodging a compensation claim against the Japanese government. This marks the first time that a lawsuit of its kind has ever been filed here in Korea. It will allow the women to file an official compensation suit if the Japanese government refuses to comply with the court's mediation plan. The 12 women are asking for around 100,000 U.S. dollars each. If you want the latest news from Korea and around the world, return to the negotiation. President Park Geun-hye plan given the current circumstances. On your way to work or at home, Defense Ministry. the legislature will convene a. Tune into Daybreak on Arirang TV. Here's a welcome sign that Korea may be headed towards recovery in the second half of the year. Over 50 percent of Korea's listed companies reported better than expected results in the second quarter. Our Hwang Jie reports on the signals pointing to more promising times. The slumping economy at home and abroad had tamped down expectations for Korean businesses in the second quarter, but it appears that some not only met those expectations, but exceeded them. According to an online financial information provider, FN Guide, 50 out of 93 listed companies that have announced their operating profits for the second quarter of this year reported profits higher than the market consensus. Among those 50 companies, more than 30 of them reported quarterly profits that were more than 5 percent higher than analysts' expectations. Korea's leading power equipment maker, Tusan Heavy Industries and Construction Corporation, for example, reported profits of over 280 million U.S. dollars, far exceeding the market expectation of 160 million dollars. Many other global companies, like Kia Motors and LG Display, also reported better than expected operating profits. Experts say the business showings are the result of the market's low expectations. A number of listed companies reported lower than expected earnings shock results a quarter earlier, posing a burden to the nation's stock market. Experts add that the recovery observed in major economies like the United States and Japan also boosted the company's quarterly profits. But there are looming concerns over mounting hopes of recovery in the second half of this year, as companies that haven't reported their quarterly sales are likely to show results below expectations. Experts say companies tend to delay the release of their sales reports when results turn out bad. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. The digital age has changed the way all of us live, and the business world is no exception. These days, companies are using a large collection of information taken from the internet and smartphones to drive their profits even higher. Our Kim ji reports on how Korean companies are using big data to their benefit. With the development of information and communications technology, companies in Korea are increasingly incorporating big data into their business operations. The application of big data to business is still in its initial stages in Korea, but it's expected to broaden the horizons of existing markets as well as lay the foundation for new ones that have yet to emerge. Take a look at a Korea-based analytics company that applies big data technology to real estate. Pudongsan 114 provides information to real estate agencies or to industries related to construction using its own formula created by Big Data. Having used Big Data for more than six years now, the company says it now has a comprehensive and systematic set of programs that can provide solutions to its customers. With our solution package, you can check up on the market value of a property and its fluctuation rate in real time. The data we collect and analyze can help our customers make a wise business decision. The company said it would have taken a month to do the same work with precision, but now it only takes a day using the big data technology to collect and analyze its database. This is significant since companies can quickly adapt to consumer needs and changes in the market. 
The primitive data that Pudongsang 114 and other analytics companies collect for analysis come from databases like GeoVision, provided by SK Telecom, a local telecommunications company. SK Telecom's GeoVision provides information about its subscribers by using location information provided by mobile service operators and payment information from credit card companies. The telecommunications company can then instantly identify purchase patterns in a business district of its 27 million cell phone users and categorize them according to the age of the user and the time of usage. Kim ji Arirang News. Israel has begun the release of 26 Palestinian prisoners ahead of Israeli-Palestinian peace talks set for Wednesday in Jerusalem. The 26 inmates are the first of the 104 Israel has promised to free as part of a deal secured in time for the preparatory round of talks held two weeks ago in Washington. The release was part of an agreement brokered by U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry. Israel also approved 900 new Jewish housing units in East Jerusalem, in addition to over 1,000 new settlements approved on Sunday. Palestinian officials say the settlement issues threatens the peace talks, as the homes will be built on land they would expect to keep as part of any future deal on territory. Despite the political turmoil in the Middle East and North Africa, international investors with discerning eyes see the region as a land of opportunity. In fact, many companies in the crisis-plagued region outperform their rivals in politically stable economies. Our Sun Jung-in has the details. The Middle East and North Africa is a region best known as a trouble spot. A deepening political divide between Islamists and secularists Terrorist attacks, toppling of governments and civil wars in the region constantly grab headlines in the media. But for investors who are not carried away by the headlines and focusing on fundamental values and performances, the area offers lucrative investment opportunities. Even in Egypt, the scene of long political uncertainties, now suffering from the ousting of President Mohamed Morsi last month, has seen its stocks go up by 3 percent this year. That compares with a fall of about 10 percent in the MSCI Emerging Markets Index, a benchmark for emerging markets. If you're nervous about such symbols of political instability as Egypt and Syria, look for neighboring nations such as Abu Dhabi and Qatar, whose stock markets soared by between 65 percent and 25 percent in 2013. In fact, governments of many Gulf nations have been increasing spending to prevent political unrest, creating a consumer boom in those economies. Qatar boasts bountiful gas deposits, but spending ahead of the 2022 World Cup it will be hosting means there will be a lot of opportunities in the country's non-energy sectors. In oil-rich Saudi Arabia, foreign investors are expected to benefit from a widely expected plan to reform its stock market, especially after it recently shifted its weekend from Thursday and Friday to the regional standard of Friday and Saturday. So if you can locate efficiently run companies, don't let headlines screaming political strife get in the way of reaping handsome profits. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. And a good Wednesday morning, everyone, as we kick things off with a big matchup taking place later tonight. Of course, South Korea taking on Peru at the Suwon World Cup Stadium for their warm-up match. Now, South Korea is still without a win since manager Hong myung wo took over the team, and they still have a lot of things to work on. Of course, with the Taeguk Warriors facing off against the 22nd-ranked Peru leader tonight, they won't have their European players available once again. Manager Hong working mostly with the domestic players, just like he did during the East Asian Cup. But the most important thing is their defense once again with the high offense Peruvian team. The manager Hong emphasized that this will be a great warm-up for his team. 
Meanwhile, the manager plans to travel to Europe after this match to watch which players he can utilize for the upcoming World Cup in Brazil. Now, another big game to look forward to in a few hours. The South Korean lefty Ryun Jin going after his 12th win of the season as he's set to face off against the New York Mets at home at Dodger Stadium. And what a matchup this is going to be with the South Korean going up against the Mets ace Matt Harvey, who's currently 9 and 3 with an impressive ERA of 2.09. Meanwhile, after winning four straight to start the second half of the season, Ryun Jin is currently 11 and 3 with an ERA of 2.99 as he hopes to win his 12th win of the season. Meanwhile, the LA Dodgers have been red hot lately, setting a new team record of 38 and 8 in their last 46 games. And now, staying in baseball, but back here in the nation as we take a look at some Tuesday night KBO action. Now, the SK Wyverns continue to stay red hot, while the Kia Tigers continue to slide as SK breeze past Kia 9 to 2. Also, the NC Dinos beat the Hanoi Eagles 3 to 1 in the game between. 8th and 9th place team. So with that said, let's take a look at the other two games here. Starting off with the Tucson Bears taking on the Lothi Giants in Seoul. Of course, taking a look at the game here, we go over to the third inning. Met on second and third. Chejun Suk grounds out to second. Tucson takes the early 1-0 lead. Now we're going to shift over to the fourth inning here. Check out this next play. Ewan Suk hits one down the left field line. Past Hwang Jae-gyun. Goes to second on a double. But wait, who's covering third? No one. Ewan Suk sneaks into third base. And you know what? That looks to be costly as Yang Yi Ji. He's going to single up the middle as Tucson takes the lead 2 to nothing. But now we're going to shift over to the eighth inning. Hong Sang Sam in relief. Uh oh, not again. Park Jun Sa sends one deep to left. If it's fair, it's trouble, and it's gone. Two run shot as Lotte ties this game up two to two. Now, lucky for Hong Sang Sam, Lee Won Suk's sack fly in the eighth inning brings home Chung Soo Bin, and he is safe at home as Tucson sneaks one past the Lotte Giants three to two as the Tucson Bears now take a one and a half game lead over the Nexon Heroes. And next up, the big series of the week. The LG Twins taking on the Samsung Lions. Tied 2-2 in the second inning. Payung Sub singles to center. Let's make that 3-2 Samsung Lions. But we're not done yet. Big man of the Samsung Lions, Che Hyung Woo. This time, another RBI single before this next play. Samsung Lions, Lion King, Lee Sun Yup. RBI double to right. Samsung takes the lead 5-2. But in the third inning comes along and LG lights it up with seven runs, including Pagyong Tech's two-run single to center. Before this next play here, we haven't heard of this guy in a while. Kwon Yong Guan, a three-run shot to left. LG takes the lead 12-5. to five. Now fifth inning of the game, Samsung making it interesting with a four-run fifth, including this one from Pei up a two-run single, and it's 12-9 to nine after five innings. But the LG Twins continue to swing away, including this one. Ebyung Gyu's two-run double in the ninth drops one in there as LG takes this game 16 to nine as they're now tied for first with the Samsung Lions. And now finishing things off with basketball. After the South Korean national basketball team finished third in the Asian Basketball Championships, they were awarded 100 million won or roughly 89,000 U.S. dollars to be split amongst everyone on the team evenly. But their next question is, are they going to bring in a foreigner on the national team? Well, with the Korean team qualifying for the World Cup taking place in Spain next year, it's no surprise that their biggest disadvantage is their height. But sources say that the team is thinking about bringing in a foreigner to join the team. Of course, before all that, the player needs to get his Korean citizenship if he wants to play on the team. Now, many foreigners have tried to get the citizenship to play for the South Korean national football team, but have failed. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. See you guys again for your sports needs. Happy Wednesday morning to you. I'm Lee ji with your latest weather updates. Now the unpleasant hot weather is shaping up to continue today as a high pressure from North Pacific sits over. So we're looking at a hot day with highs in the mid to upper 30s. So heat wave advisories and warnings are still in effect across the peninsula. So the sweltering heat will persist. Now there will be unbroken sunshine in many areas of peninsula. So expect to have very high 
high UV index across the nation. So don't forget to apply a good amount of sunscreen and remember to wear sunglasses to protect your eyes. Sun will be shining down strong today. Now for tomorrow, we are not expecting to see any significant changes. It's going to be another scorching day. But early next week, light rain is in the forecast in the central region and that should bring the temperatures down a bit and southern provinces will also get some relief from the heat. Now right now the morning clouds are seen in much of the peninsula but it should give away to uh, plenty of sunshine later on so it's gonna be another hot and sunny day with 85% humidity this morning. With that let's take a look at today's numbers. Now the capital and Busan should jump up to 33 degrees Celsius that's 91 degrees Fahrenheit and intense heat wave continues in Daegu and Gwangju at 37 and 36. Now moving over to other places, uh, Jeju and Tokyo should hike up to 33, while Daejeon and Mount Kungang tops out at 34. Now that's all for me at this hour. Enjoy your morning commute and have a wonderful day. Now back to Yusan in the studio. Thank you, Jihyun. And those are the stories we're following at this hour. Stay with us throughout the day as we bring you the latest headlines.